Hi, my name is Davide Bollati and uh, I am the chairman of Davines Comfort Zone Group. At Davines, we are so honored to be sponsored for the first time of the World Happiness Report 2020. Our wish is that this report will not be seen just as a mere ranking of countries from top down, but instead as an inspiring learning tool for all of us to imagine and create a better version of our world, a world that we as human race inhabit and not just dispose of it. We humans should more and more inhabit this world with respect and awareness of the most varied interdependencies. Whether happiness is explored and measured in the context of uh, subjectivity or objectivity, countries or cities, people versus economy or the whole planet, the way we inhabit it as a species will become more and more crucial in the years to come for the sustainability of that same ecosystem in which we as humans are working to find the ultimate formula of happiness. Isn't it becoming clearer and clearer day after day? Thank you and best wishes to the 2020 World Happiness Report. Good morning. Let me start this uh, brief message by thanking so much the UN SDSN team for uh, this eighth World Happiness Report. I think that this year, more than ever, people will uh, be conscious about the importance of this uh, important work. As a matter of fact, in our society, we were implicitly in doubt whether it was more important people or business. Now, with this dramatic pandemic, coronavirus, it's a very strong wake-up call, remembering us that it's all about people, people, people. So, in this uh, World Happiness Day, I would like to make a wish, first of all, to remember. To remember the importance of happiness for everybody's life. To remember how everything is interconnected. Social life, health, the economy. It's like uh, coronavirus came to remember us that we are not God. And besides remembering, my wish is to prepare for the next time. I'm amazed about how unprepared was the society for this pandemic. We are prepared for everything, war, fires, anything except for pandemics. So I think that the UNSDSN team could do a great job in uh, recommending a plan for after coronavirus so that even skeptical people skeptical people thinking that happiness is a nice to have it is not and prepare for enduring happiness in the decades ahead hi my name is jen gross and i'm the co-founder of the blue chip foundation an organization that makes grants to advance the sdgs at this moment of pandemic, health and well-being are naturally a global priority as we prepare for the worst while hoping for the best. The coronavirus unquestionably threatens to undermine two of the driving indicators of well-being that the World Happiness Report identifies, health and income. Yet the emergency measures the United States is taking to address it highlight how reactive our national approach to well-being is in contrast to how proactive it could be. I believe that the donor community must do more to ensure that we support increasingly proactive approaches to well being. Philanthropy is already focused on key well being pillars like health and income, but communities require more than that. 
they also need higher levels of equality, trust, and interpersonal support. So how do we do this? We can look to cities for guidance. Here in the greater Los Angeles area where I live, the city of Santa Monica has pioneered the Wellbeing Project. They fund initiatives addressing economic inequality and social isolation, such as an early childhood development center. Philanthropy was key to making this program possible. It's impossible to speak about well-being today without acknowledging how this report can help us right now to fight back against the threat of the coronavirus. As one first step, we are making donations to organizations that support our most vulnerable citizens by investing in their urgent, increased, and sustained well-being. Among these is the National Domestic Workers Alliance which supports marginalized workers that take care of our homes and our families. In addition, we will donate to the World Central Kitchen that currently serves Angelinos in need of meals. I hope everyone watching today will not only review this year's report, but will also integrate its findings into the work you do to establish new standards of government of, by, and for the broader well-being of citizens. I believe doing so is the best way to rebound stronger from the current health crisis than we began it. Thank you, stay safe, and be well. Hi everyone, I'm Ian Maskell, Head of Marketing at Walls, the world's largest Walls, ice cream company, and proudly part of Unilever. Proud. I'm based in Rotterdam, and today I'm quarantined in Amsterdam, which is why I can't be with you in New York. It's an honour to be part of this launch event for the World Happiness Report 2020 and many thanks to Jeff and Sharon for making us feel so welcome as part of the World Happiness family at SDSN. Walls has been bringing happiness to the heart of communities for more than 100 years and our vision is to make the world a happier, more inclusive place, one street at a time. Our partnership with the World Happiness Report marks a step up in our ambition as we launch the WALLS Human Happiness Movement. WALLS will be focusing on social support as a key lever to build happier communities and we will be campaigning to put happiness first across the world. We believe that our scale brings a new dimension to the amazing work pioneered by Jeff, Richard, John and Jan Emanuel and the team at the World Happiness Report. WALLS serves more than 20 billion portions of happiness every year in over 150 markets and we hope that this will be the start of a very fruitful partnership with the World Happiness Report. We wish you all the best for the launch of the 2020 report and we hope that you can all stay safe and happy as we go through the rest of 2020. Many thanks, good luck and goodbye. Hello everyone, happy International Day of Happiness and welcome to the launch of the 2020 World Happiness Report. This year's theme is Environments for Happiness. My name is Lara Aknan and I'm an associate co-editor of the report and I'll be your MC today. Thank you for joining us, especially in these unprecedented times. We've altered our program to address the importance of happiness and how it will be impacted during the current pandemic. Before we begin, Ms. Cheyenne Maddox will give us a brief technical, some brief technical instructions for our webinar. Hi everyone, uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank you who know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the upper right corner. You're listening in using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the phone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's present presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Cheyenne. 
We will now turn to Professor Jeffrey Sachs, President of the SDSN and Director of the S Center for Sustainable Development to start us off. Please go ahead, Jeff. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I hope uh, everybody is uh, staying safe uh, and is uh, comfortable uh, wherever they are. Uh, it was very inspiring to hear uh, the words of all our partners uh, and also to consider that in every location, uh, we really are uh, right now only able to interact virtually in this way. California, where oh, Jack sure. Rose and Lucha Foundation is located, uh, announced a complete uh, lockdown this morning. Uh, and of course, uh, as uh, Ian uh, Maskell uh, of Walls uh, Ice Cream uh, said, uh, he's uh, locked down. The UN is operating virtually uh, at the moment without any uh, meetings uh, beyond uh, very small numbers of people. We're in a completely uh, unprecedented and uh, dramatic time in, in the modern uh, era. This is a, a very serious, a very dire uh, global pandemic, uh, and uh, we're entering a wave of uh, accelerated uh, harm and uh, danger. So first, I want to bid everybody to take good care and uh, exercise uh, extreme caution. Well, our theme uh, today of happiness, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's very complicated uh, in, in the face of uh, this pandemic. Uh, it is our source of hope uh, and humanity, uh, and uh, that's why we celebrate uh, a global a day of happiness on March 20th each year, uh, and why I'm uh, thrilled uh, and honored to be part of a wonderful group uh, who are the pioneers of uh, my co my co-editors, I should say, not me, who are the pioneers of uh, this area. So we're going to hear from John Halliwell in just a moment. We'll discuss uh, how this uh, important uh, work, uh, John Halliwell, Richard Laird, and Laura Acknon, uh, John uh, Yana Manuel, uh, Inev, uh, can really help us uh, in this uh, difficult period, uh, and also, of course, how it can uh, shed light on how our societies should be, uh, as Jen Gross put it, proactively uh, organized to be promoting happiness when we get back to uh, more normal times, and we will. Uh, I, we uh, will get through this, uh, but we have to get through this together, uh, and we have to get through this through decisive action. Well, let me uh, not to delay any longer. We're going to hear from John Helliwell, whose uh, analytical work uh, is uh, at the very foundation of our report each year. We'll hear about the rankings. We'll hear about the determinants of well-being. And then we'll have a discussion about uh, happiness uh, and COVID-19, uh, the interactions and the implications. And then we'll hear from the wonderful uh, chapter authors uh, who have written spectacular pieces, absolutely fascinating pieces in this year's report. So let me turn it over uh, back to uh, our moderator, to uh, Lara, and then uh, to uh, John Helliwell. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so we'll now hear from the World Happiness Report co-editors, John Helliwell, Richard Laird, Jan Emanuel, uh, Dinev and Jeff Sachs as they discuss the first two chapters of this year's report and uh, with special mention to COVID-19 and well-being. So please hold all questions until the end uh, of our session and if you do have questions please feel free to submit them in the application. John, may you please begin. Absolutely, Lara, and uh, my best to everyone on this call. Their thanks for being with us. As we organized this report, of course, this was long before the first case of COVID-19. Uh, and so it's only chance that, in fact, our emphasis this year on the environments for happiness has taken us into areas that do speak to what we're going through uh, now. I will start first uh, with looking at what we ha often have as the headline item 
from the report, which is how countries around the world uh, rank in terms of their evaluations of their lives. If you uh, could put up the first slide, please, I'll show you the figure that's standard in our reports. And the uh, colored bars at the left show you uh, how much of nations' average evaluations of their lives depend on six things that we found explain more than three quarters of the differences across countries and over time uh, in how people value their lives, their income per capita, social support, uh, healthy life expectancy, uh, sense of freedom to make life choices, generosity, and perceptions of corruption. Now, uh, that's a limited measure uh, for trust. All of those, of course, are uh, threatened in uh, times of need, but several of them come into special power at that time. And uh, I'm going to uh, note uh, that uh, the emphasis on the three environments for happiness we look at on the report are the social environments, the natural environments, and urban rural environments compared. And uh, you'll hear about those later. I'm going to take you first for a moment or two into the social environments for happiness, where our uh, evidence this year, uh, just by chance, as it turns out, focuses on things that are very important in these very uh, current times. What we looked at and found is that uh, countries and communities where people trust each other and uh, trust their institutions are ones where people value their lives more highly. All the top ranked countries, uh, Finland uh, is once again uh, for the third year at the top of the list by an even slightly greater margin this year. But basically the countries that are in the top five this year include four people who, but four countries have been the top of the whole list. And they're all countries, as indeed are all the top 10 and 20, countries where all of those six factors are in good supply. But the Nordic countries, we'll see this again in chapter seven, uh, are unusual in a sense that they're all always in the top uh, 10 uh, countries and often in the top five and right at the top. And one of the things they have uh, in those countries is quite a high degree of personal social connections and high levels of trust in their public institutions. And we found that uh, when we uh, then asked ourselves, uh, one more thing before I go move to the next slide, and that is that not just our trust in others and trust in institutions important for everybody. They're especially important for people who are suffering from in current troubles. For example, people who feel they're subject to discrimination, people in ill health, people who are unemployed, people with low incomes, people who are uh, frightened. And uh, what we did is that of course means inequality is much less when uh, the uh, levels of trust are higher because the people most in trouble are most benefited by that high trust. So as an experiment after this modeling, we then said, what, what would happen if all the people in Europe had the same trust levels as in the Nordic countries? And if we could move to the next picture, that's what we'll show you. So here, the, the black and white distribution is the actual levels, the fitted levels of uh, life evaluation on a zero to 10 scale uh, of all the individuals sampled of many hundreds of thousands all over Europe. And then in the green figures, we show in the, in the darker green one, what would happen if everybody in Europe at the same levels of social trust and trust in institutions as they do uh, in Norway and, and Nordic countries generally, not just Norway. And you can see immediately what happens that in fact, not only is the average higher, but the distribution is much closer. And you find those countries are in fact, the ones that uh, have the, not just the highest levels, but the, less, the, the least inequality. 
it, this does not mean in the COVID-19 terms that if you aren't a Nordic country, you're not going to do well in this. These are individuals all over the world we're looking at. We find that in every community, the capacity is there. We found it in, in earthquakes and in tsunamis and otherwise, that these tough times invite societies and individuals to work together uh, in order to build better lives for each other. And we find the extent to which they do so uh, not only generates more trust, but in fact, uh, they rely very much on each other. And so you find a bit of a uh, something extra that uh, is often seen as a surprise by people that very difficult times sometimes uh, bring out the best in people and often bring out the best in people and they end up being actually pleasantly surprised at the extent to which their neighbors uh, will pool work together with them in order to see life through a difficult period and of course having seen that it's then much better uh, going back afterwards. Uh, one more thing I should mention before I pass over to the uh, uh, other editors is that I think we have to think differently about the term social distancing, which has been used as part of the required response uh, in the current circumstances. I, I would like to suggest that we don't need social distancing. We need social closeness with physical distancing, because that's what the stake is. We have to learn how to connect with the warmth that close personal contact always does. We have to keep those connections alive and build them when we're doing the two meter hug and the electronic connection. And that's gonna require a lot of innovation, but the power for that innovation lies within all of us. And I invite you to exploit it. And I will now pass back uh, to Lara. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, we'll now hear from Professor Sachs. Jeff, over to you. Oh, Jeff, sorry to interrupt, but we cannot hear you yet. Sorry, I thought I had pressed that button. Uh, thank you very much for the words of wisdom, John. And uh, I'll say a few words uh, about the epidemic uh, itself, uh, the uh, uh, economy and uh, some of the early implications uh, very, very quickly. Uh, we have a... Uh, a virus and a world population that is uh, uh, immunologically naive to this virus. Uh, there is no immunity from earlier waves of infection. So in principle, as far as we know, everybody is vulnerable. Of course, older people are much more vulnerable to serious illness and to death. It's estimated that 80% of the mortality occurs in people 60 and over or people with uh, prior uh, medical conditions. Uh, so far, the uh, only real way to control uh, this pandemic uh, is what John referred to as physical distancing, uh, and uh, which is uh, referred to commonly as social distancing, but it is uh, acting to stop the transmission between uh, people. and. Uh, currently, uh, China uh, and other countries mm -hmm. in East Asia are having relative success in this, and the countries of Europe and uh, uh, North America so far, very little success. Uh, but uh, we are still, we hope, uh, at a controllable phase of this epidemic. Uh, what has worked so far are clampdowns uh, in China. Uh, lockdowns of society, and that method is spreading. Now, the economic ramifications are very serious and dire, of course, uh, because uh, this is a deliberate closure of a significant part of the economy, uh, unprecedented in uh, modern history. Uh, output absolutely globally uh, not only will not grow, but will decline by many percent uh, of uh, GDP uh, in uh, the first half of uh, 2020. 
uh, it will be a much deeper decline than 2008, and it will create a tremendous amount of uh, economic distress. Uh, what uh, are the lessons for policy uh, in this? Well, uh, I think the only things uh, we can say with high confidence are act to stop decisively the spread of the infection uh, and uh, don't wait, don't do it too late, uh, because once it's out of control, it's extraordinarily costly. Second, protect the vulnerable populations, especially uh, older people, people with uh, prior health conditions uh, and the indigent. Uh, and uh, third, provide social support. Uh, and uh, this means the kind of solidarity uh, redistribution of uh, income, uh, support for the poor, uh, not only that our partners uh, spoke about at the top of the hour, but that John Helliwell emphasized as being part and parcel of uh, the uh, model of Finland and the other countries uh, ranking uh, at the height of the epidemic. Let me just say again, we're thinking of people everywhere uh, in Italy, very hard hit, where we have our, our wonderful partners uh, of uh, uh, Andrea Illy uh, and uh, Davide Bellotti and uh, their fantastic companies. Take care. We are really in the hard phase of this. The economics are not good. We're going to have to share uh, a very, very sharp a crisis in the coming months. Uh, let me turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. We'll now hear from Richard Laird. Richard, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we are in a very difficult situation, but I do believe that if we handle it right, uh, we can come out of this better than we went into it. We can come out of it with a society in which people are caring more for each other, uh, and in which they are taking better care of themselves. So let me start with the care for others. Obviously, uh, as Jeff has said, we're going to have millions of people self-isolated, not just to protect themselves, but to protect others. We're going to have lots of healthy people looking after frail and lonely people, uh, either uh, directly or remotely. Uh, we're going to have millions of people looking after other people's children who are not in school. And of course, we're going to have millions of uh, healthcare workers risking their lives on our behalf. Now, all of these kinds of actions went on every day in the Second World War. There was an unprecedented level of fellow feeling. Uh, and what's important is that it went on uh, for years and decades after that. So I think we can emerge from this with a society in which we are valuing cooperation a lot more strongly uh, relative to competition. Um, I also hope that our government will be giving a much higher priority uh, to our personal well-being uh, in the years to come. So let's just look at a few facts. In Europe and the USA, more people have already died from this epidemic than in the whole of East Asia, non-communist uh, as well as communist, even though that is an area with double population and where the virus started. So what's been going on in the West? Basically, we have given priority to sustaining the GDP over the well-being of the people. And that's got to change. Uh, as uh, Thomas Jefferson said, the life and the happiness of the people are actually the first and only responsibilities of the government. Uh, so let's hope that governments too, as well as our culture, will emerge with a far greater focus on people's well-being. Finally, ourselves. It will obviously require a, a lot of wisdom for all of us to come through this period of huge anxiety for everybody. But of course, some people will suffer a lot more. People who lose their loved ones, uh, people who lose their jobs and don't have governments wise enough uh, to sustain their livelihoods. Uh, we've all got to find 
inner resources to draw on. Um, I personally am going to be drawing on, on the 10 keys to happier living uh, that are put out by the organization called Action for Happiness, actionforhappiness.org. Uh, and these spell out uh, the letters for great dream. So, so great is the five, as it were, fruit and veg we have to do every day uh, to keep our spirits up. Giving, relating, even if remotely, uh, exercising, appreciating what we've got, and trying out new things. These are things uh, that we shall do every day, and we shall also think about the longer term things in the dream, which is like direction. It may be a time to reappraise uh, what really matters to us in life. So this is a very, very hard time, but I do believe it can have a silver lining. I think we can end up uh, with a society which is more fellow feeling, uh, more concern for the common good, uh, and in which people are better focused on the things that really matter to them. So let's hope uh, uh, that that works out well and very good luck to all of you. Thank you very much for that, Richard. We'll now to turn to our final co-editor of the report, um, Jan Emanuel. Please, Jan. Uh, thank you, Lara, and I hope everyone is uh, is doing uh, as well as, as as he or she possibly can. Um, I want to follow up on the wise words of Richard, uh, John, and Jeff, uh, and note that it goes without saying that the notion of social distancing really is the wrong label from a well-being perspective, uh, and we should be practicing physical distancing while staying socially connected. Uh, and this happens, in fact, and this is important, mostly through our jobs, even if these meetings now take place mostly over Zoom or Skype. Uh, so I will speak a little bit about the relationship uh, between well-being and work in light of the coronavirus uh, epidemic. And so while the initial focus uh, throughout the epidemic has clearly been on understanding the health risks of the coronavirus and containing its spread, you will have noticed that attention has now squarely also turned to the economic impact, and in particular, how it is affecting work and the workplace. Uh, in fact, a new poll by our friends at Gallup just confirmed that already half of US workers believe that the coronavirus will have a negative effect on their workplace, and I would expect this to increase much further in the coming weeks. The science of well-being can help explain these very real worries that people have related to their jobs, and perhaps even offer policy guidance on what actions could mitigate the negative impact on well-being. Uh, my work and that of many others in our field has shown over and over again just how important work is for happiness. In fact, being made redundant reduces one's life satisfaction by about 20%. And importantly, it doesn't easily recover from this drop. Uh, worse still, actually, we find that there to be we find there to be psychological scarring effects even after gaining re-employment. Uh, also important to note is that the and to understand from a well-being perspective is that the loss in income. Uh, from being made redundant only accounts for about half of the big drop uh, in life satisfaction. The rest is due to losing part of your identity, a routine throughout the day, and especially losing part of one's social network. So these non-pecuniary drivers of workplace well-being are not, are not typically taken into account in the policies that are, are now being proposed. And I want to give and illustrate this with a quick example. If you look at the United States today, uh, you'll likely see that there will be about 1 million new unemployment claims this week alone. Uh, and it's hard to put in words just how devastating the impact on well-being will be uh, from this unprecedented tsunami of job losses. Uh, a lot of the proposals to deal with this uh, aim mostly at replacing the lost income by, for example, sending out $1,000 checks to every American family. And while this may be necessary, it would not be sufficient to maintain levels of well-being for the reasons just highlighted. Because for that, we really need to keep people paid and in their jobs. Uh, economic stimulus packages that center, for example, on funding paid leave for a certain period to avoid redundancies will do a much better job, I think, at maintaining well-being levels. Uh, and in fact, the most radical example uh, that has come out in recent days would be Denmark, um, very high up in our well-being rankings, needless to say, where the government has just promised to cover 75% of salaries of private, at private companies for three months on the condition that they do not let staff go. And well-being research also provides insight into just how much people are willing to pay to deal with unemployment. 
Uh, Andrew Oswald and colleagues found that people are willing to trade off about 1.7% of inflation just to guard against a 1% increase in unemployment. And so these job security programs to bridge this period of this epidemic can, can cost something in the minds of people and may even come at the cost of some future gains in growth if need be. Indeed, we found in recent work that people's well-being is twice as sensitive to downturns as compared to equivalent upswings, suggesting that people are willing to ensure against downturns that threaten their jobs. Um, I'll end uh, by where I started uh, by uh, putting another plea for doing physical distancing while staying socially connected. And given that this happens mostly through having a job, even if online these days, we really need to do everything we can to maintain people in their jobs. Over to you, Lara. Thank you very much, everyone, for these very important and timely insights. Um, we'll now hear from uh, each of our chapter authors themselves to give uh, brief overviews of the content of their report. So the first person we'll be hearing from is Christian Kreckel at the London School of Economics and co-author of Chapter 3, entitled Cities and Happiness, a Global Ranking and Analysis. Over to you, Christian. Thank you, Lara. Perfect. Do we have the slides somewhere? Ah, yeah, wonderful. Okay, thanks. Um, hello also from my side. Um, I hope that you're all feeling well. Uh, the title of our chapter is Cities and Happiness, a Global Ranking and Analysis. And this is joint work with Jan Emanuel de Neve, who we've just seen from the University of Oxford. Could we have the next slide, please? Right, so what is our chapter about? Our chapter is the first global ranking of city happiness. Why are we looking at cities in addition to countries? That's because most people today, more than half of the world's population are living in urban areas. The trend is that this is going to be increased by about 1.5 times to about 6 billion or 75% by the middle of this uh, century. Cities are really important. They're economic powerhouses. Um, they allow for an efficient allocation of labor, higher productivity, hence higher incomes. So all these good agglomeration benefits, but at the same time, there are also, of course, negative externalities. Um, there might be a lack of affordable housing, there might be lack of green spaces, uh, higher densification brings with it more pollution, for example. So these are all things which need to be balanced against each other, and it's important to find out um, how city dwellers do on average uh, in terms of their quality of life. And I think this is also very well um, summarized in uh, SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, which actually, if you read it very carefully, includes many, many items that are relevant for happiness. So why are we looking at happiness? That's because uh, we argue that city dwellers themselves are the best judges of what matters to them and to their quality uh, of life. We think that actually looking at self-reported happiness is a democratic way to look at quality of life. And our ranking is hence much different from um, other rankings of cities which look at quality of living and uh, which are basically list on objective uh, which are basically based on objective lists which researchers or or policymakers define ex ante that's a top down approach we essentially have a, a bottom up approach we look at self reported happiness how do we do this um, we basically collected a national representative uh, data from the Gallup world poll and the Gallup us poll which includes self reported uh, items on how city dwellers uh, evaluate their lives. And what we do is we basically create simple mean rankings of life evaluation on a 0 to 10 scale without any manipulation of uh, about 186 cities in more than 160 countries. Can I have the next slide, please? Right, so this is basically our main result uh, at the top. So these are the worldwide top 20 cities in terms of uh, how people evaluate their lives. And you can see if you look at the very top, the top 10, you can see that there are many familiar faces in terms of the country rankings of happiness. So we have Helsinki in Finland ranked one, Aarhus in Denmark ranked two, and Wellington in New Zealand ranked a third. So many of the cities in the top 10 are actually Scandinavian cities. And if we extend this list to the top 20, we see that there are also many cities from uh, Australia, New Zealand, and partly North America. So pretty much our ranking, our global ranking of city happiness corroborates our ranking of uh, country happiness, which delves, of course, into the question whether city happiness is essentially the same as country happiness. And that's something we can see on the next slide, where we basically tabulated uh, country happiness versus uh, city happiness. 
um, across all countries, which is on the left. Um, and here you can see that the, the red line is essentially the 45 degree line, which means equality between city uh, happiness and country happiness. And what you can see is there's indeed a high correlation, but it's not necessarily the same. And you can see that on balance, it seems that people in, living in, kit, in cities seem to report a higher uh, happiness. If you look at the right uh, graph, you can see that this becomes actually much more pronounced uh, in low income countries. So according to the World Bank definition, here actually people living in cities report a higher happiness than people in the country on average, which seems to suggest that living in a rural area in, uh, in a low income country actually is associated with lower happiness. Um, on the next slide, we basically then look at uh, happiness inequalities. Again, we look at the very simple uh, measure of dispersion of happiness and equality, which is simply the standard deviation. And we basically um, uh, tabulate the standard deviation uh, at the country level in happiness with that at the city level in happiness. Again, for all countries, when you can see that happiness equality inequality is highly correlated at the country level and at the city with the city level, but it's not necessarily the same. So what can we say in some in our uh, in our uh, chapter? The cities that are ranking highest, and you can see this on the next slide, the cities that are ranking highest in terms of how, how people evaluate their lives are essentially located in Scandinavia, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and to some extent in North America. So it's quite similar to our country ranking. It should be noted, however, that there are cities in Latin America and the Caribbean where people rank themselves very high in terms of expected future life evaluation, despite the fact that their current life evaluation may not be as high. So there's a quite high optimism in uh, cities in Latin America and the Caribbean region. That's reported in the chapter alongside with uh, other indicators of uh, happiness, namely positive and negative effect. Please do check out the chapter. We also have the full 186 uh, city ranking in the chapter. And as a final word, I'd like to say that our um, <clears throat> city ranking um, based on happiness partly mirrors that uh, of other city rankings based on objective lists but there are also clear differences. So it's important for future research to find out what these differences, why these differences exist and what is driving uh, happiness in cities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Very interesting to see the happiness uh, rankings uh, by city. This is the first year I believe that's happened. So thank you very much. Um, I'll remind you to please turn off your video. Thank you. Um, and so now um, we will turn to a video pre-recorded um, from Martin Berger at Erasmus University in Rotterdam, who is a co-author of Chapter 4, which is entitled Urban Rural Happiness, Differentials Across the World, providing another and extended uh, investigation into the uh, exploration of happiness in urban and rural areas around the globe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Martijn Burger from the Erasmus Happiness Economics Research Organization. Today I will be presenting to you the highlights of Chapter 4 of the World Happiness Report 2020. This chapter is co-authored by Philip Morrison from the Victoria University of Wellington and Martijn Hendricks and Marloes Hogebrugge from the Erasmus University Rotterdam. Chapter 4 explores the differences in levels of happiness between urban and rural populations within each country worldwide. First, we studied who is happier. Is it the people of cities or their rural counterparts? We indeed found that there are differences in happiness across living environments, and we further examined the Gallup data in order to see why these differences exist. There are three main takeaways of chapter four. Takeaway one, in most countries, people living in cities are happier than people in the countryside. The graph on the right hand side shows that on a scale from 0 to 10, 10 being the happiest, the worldwide average life evaluation for the urban population is a 5.5, whereas the life evaluation for the rural population is a 5.1. The differences between the urban and rural population are the largest in East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, followed by South Asia and Southern Europe. However, this is not a global phenomenon. In countries in the Western world, such as the United Kingdom, the Netherlands and New Zealand, we find that the average life evaluation of the rural population is actually higher than the average life evaluation of the urban population. This finding is surprising 
because metropolitan centers in the Western world continue to attract people and generate a disproportionate share of their country's wealth. Takeaway 2. Higher urban happiness in most parts of the world can be explained by higher standards of living and the better economic opportunities present in cities. If we look at the underlying reasons for the urban and rural happiness differentials, we see that urban areas in the developing world are happier because they are typically offer a higher quality of life in terms of income, employment opportunities and access to public services. When we look for example at Sub-Saharan Africa, we see that the urban population is richer, higher educated and has less problems to make ends meet. These urban benefits typically outweigh the possible negative aspects of living in cities, such as the higher cost of living, higher levels of pollution, higher levels of traffic congestion, and higher crime rates. Takeaway 3. Lower urban happiness in the Western world can be explained by less affordable housing, lower levels of community attachment, and more single-person households in cities. In addition, we see that due to technological developments, many residents in rural areas in the Western world are no longer dependent upon farming, and the recent expansion of urban centers means that many rural residents live and work nowadays in close proximity to these urban centers. Accordingly, rural residents are able to borrow the positive effects of much larger places, such as employment opportunities and amenities, while at the same time, they are relatively protected from the negative effects of cities. We also see that there are considerable differences in urban rural happiness between the more affluent countries. In some countries, cities are happier, while in other countries, the countryside is happier. These findings suggest that more research is needed to better understand the urban rural differences in happiness within specific countries. What we also need to do in future research is to better understand what kind of living environment matters for what kind of people. I hope that you will find our research interesting to read. For now, I hope you stay safe and wishing you all the best in these difficult times. All right. Um, nice to have Martin join us electronically and on, by pre-recorded video and lovely to see the consistency um, and detail across these two chapters. We will now move on to George McCarran at the University of Sussex and co-founder and CTO of Psychological Technologies, also a co-author of Chapter 5, which is entitled How Environmental Quality Affects Our Happiness. Thanks, George. Thank you, Lara. And of course, this work is joint with Chris Crackle of uh, the LSE, who we heard from just a moment ago uh, before Martin. So if we look at our first slide, um, there's increasing concern around the world and justified concern for our environment, for our natural environment and the quality of our environments in general, particularly around climate change, of course, um, thinking of Greta Thunberg, Extinction Rebellion, but also in terms of biodiversity, plastics in the ocean, organic pollutants and so on. And in fact, 62% of respondents on the Gallup World Poll say that they would prioritise environmental protection over economic growth. Now, as the background to this chapter, there are several reasons to think that natural environments and high environmental quality will do good things for our happiness. Uh, in the first place, there's perhaps an innate connection between people and nature, uh, which has evolutionary origins and has been called biophilia. Uh, in addition, natural environments and good quality environments help to facilitate positive behaviours uh, such as physical exercise, which hopefully we can all keep doing, uh, and social interaction, um, where we're, as, as pa other panelists have said, we're, we're hoping to do distant socializing rather than social distancing uh, in the near future. This relationship, though, is, is sometimes difficult to prove, uh, partly because uh, it's difficult sometimes to measure people's exposures to different elements of their environments, uh, and also because natural experiments um, are a little bit hard to come by. Uh, but the literature takes a range of approaches to, to getting around this, and, and some of those are, um, are surveyed and reviewed in this chapter, which is one of this chapter's uh, key contributions, I think. Uh, we also do some of our own empirical work here, uh, and we take two empirical approaches uh, in chapter five. In the first place, we look at a very high level across countries, um, at life evaluation, positive and negative effect, using data from the Gallup World Poll, and linking that to environment data from the OECD and the World Bank. 
And then at the very other end of uh, the scale, uh, we take a very low level, a very local approach, and we do an analysis within a single city of the world, uh, which is London. Uh, and in here, we have repeated happiness ratings with a timestamp and a GPS location. So really detailed data, uh, which comes from the Mappiness app, uh, which does experience sampling. And then we're able to link that with lots of data, spatial data on immediate environments, such as weather, air pollution, land cover, and green spaces. Um, there are advantages to each approach. An advantage to our first approach, of course, is that it applies to many regions of the world. It's generalizable. Advantages of the low level, the second approach, um, are that um, we get a much better estimate of people's exposure. Uh, we're not subject to various kinds of country level co confounding. Um, I better move on uh, to what we find. So the, the, the high level results from our cross country comparison tell us that uh, emissions of air pollution, in particular particulate emissions, uh, PM10 and PM2.5, uh, are associated with uh, significantly reduced happiness across the countries of the world. And we find that a 1% increase in PM10, the larger particulates, for example, is associated with a drop of about 1 150th of one point on the 0 to 10 life evaluation scale. Now, that's a small increase in happiness, but then a 1% increase um, in air pollution is also a small increase. So these are meaningful effect sizes. Uh, if we move on to our next slide, the second approach at the micro local level, and this is based on around half a million in the moment reports from around 15,000 volunteers telling us how they feel in London. And in the, in the chapter, you'll see one long chart that tells us all the results uh, in this area. Um, and we control for what people are doing, whom they're with, the time of day, the day of the week, uh, and individual fixed effects. So these results are, are robust to a, a wide range of confounders. Uh, and the key result that we find here we had already shown with mappiness data uh, that natural environments were on average happier than city and urban environments. Um, and what we've done here is we've focused on cities and we're saying that within cities, green and blue spaces both seem to make people uh, substantially happier. Uh, whether they're in parks or allotments or in areas where there, there are trees in the streets, both of those add about one percentage point to the happiness that people report. Uh, and the effects are even bigger for blue space. So people who are on or close to the Thames or a canal in London are between 1.3 and 2.2 percentage points happier. And those are really uh, meaningful um, happiness bumps. Um, we also find, uh, moving on to the next slide, that some of the activities that high quality natural environments best facilitate, uh, hiking, uh, gardening, nature watching, have some of the largest effects that we see on people's immediate happiness uh, in this mappiness data set overall. Uh, and I guess at the current time, we hope that, that some of these activities, even if we are not able to socialize physically close to people, um, depending on our situation, some people, we, we may still be able to get out into some of these pleasant environments, staying far from people, but enjoying uh, those green and blue spaces, which we have new compelling evidence here, I think, uh, make an important positive difference uh, to people's happiness. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, George. Um, as we transition to our next speaker, I just wanted to send a friendly reminder to everyone to please submit your questions for the authors at the chat panel. Um, these questions will be addressed in our next in our Q and A session at the end of our speakers' discussions. So next, we'll hear from Jan Emanuel Deneve, the director of the Wellbeing Research Center at the University of Oxford and co-editor of the World Happiness Report who is also a co-author of chapter six, which is entitled Sustainable Development and Human Wellbeing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lara. Um, this chapter uh, is joined uh, with Jeff Sachs and takes the notion of the environment for happiness to a broader scale as what we've heard before. Uh, and that is to see whether the degree to which societies are actually achieving sustainable development, whether or not that leads to greater well-being and happiness. And so we were particularly excited about this chapter because it links two major data gathering efforts for the first time, uh, I think. Uh, and on the one hand, that is the Gallup World Poll, which measures uh, well-being around the world, and which is obviously the basis for most of, of the World Happiness Report. And we link those data with the SDG index data compiled by the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. Uh, the result is the first global test, I think, of whether sustainable development is in fact conducive to happiness. And if we jump into the first slide, um, then you'll see the main result really of, uh, of this. And it's very much in line with intuition, which is that higher levels of sustainable development 
are strongly correlated with higher levels of well-being. Uh, in other words, the countries that are doing most in achieving the SDGs are also the ones that are doing best uh, in our World Happiness Report rankings with populations reporting higher levels of life satisfaction. So you'll recognize the Scandinavian countries all the way on top in both the SDGs and well-being. Um, this is intuitive perhaps, but where it may become less intuitive is that the slope is uh, studying the slope of this relationship. And as you'll see the red line, the, the model fit, the slope is increasingly steep. Uh, in, in economic terms, we essentially find there to be increasing marginal returns to sustainable development over time uh, in terms of well-being. Uh, in other words, uh, for countries at higher levels of development, the degree to which their development is sustainable becomes an increasingly critical driver of uh, their well-being or their population's well-being. Uh, another important question is to look into the relative importance of each one of these uh, 17 SDGs to see how they contribute to well-being. And we approach this empirical question in a number of ways, but we start with a basic correlation table. So if we can have the next slide. So if, uh, if I can ask you to focus in on the, um, the figures within the red box that I've drawn, uh, you'll see the 17 SDGs. Uh, you'll see the overall correlation is very close, is very, very tight at 0.79, which is exactly what you just saw in the previous figure. Uh, but here we split it up by the SDGs. Um, and uh, again, as expected, we find that most of the, S the 17 SDGs correlate strongly and positively with higher well-being. Uh, at the same time, by unpacking the SDGs, we also discover much heterogeneity in how some of these SDGs actually relate to well-being. And so, for example, we'll find that the SDGs on good health, uh, clean water and sanitation, decent work, industry, as well as peace and strong institutions are actually particularly strong. Uh, so all of them are important, but these are particularly important. Um, and but also note if you have more time, if you look into the regional differences, uh, that there are uh, lots of differences there too in driving well-being. The most striking result, perhaps, is actually on SDGs 12 and 13, uh, where we find a negative correlation with with well-being, uh, notwithstanding the overall SDG package to be very positively correlated with well-being. And so this this lays bare empirically, I think, for the first time, some of the tensions that we may pick up in our societies. Uh, it essentially comes down to the notion that while people may very much appreciate high quality natural environments, as George McCarran and Chris have just pointed out in their chapter discussed just now, the policies required to improve the natural environment and address climate change are difficult in terms of well-being, at least in the short run. And these tensions are on display when you, for example, compare and contrast movements such as Extinction Rebellion, uh, Rebellion and Greta Thunberg, who forcefully make the case to act on climate, and you contrast that with social movements such as the, the Yellow Vests in France, who started their strikes precisely because of climate action, uh, which was uh, fuel duties being increased. So there are these inherent tensions uh, between sustainability, especially as it relates to climate and environment, and, the uh, and, and, uh, and well-being, at least in the short run, and it requires more complex policy efforts in order to chart a course towards an environmentally sustainable and socially equitable growth that doesn't necessarily reduce human, human well-being. Um, as reported in the next table, thanks for going to the next slide, uh, we do find that the underlying measures for climate action are strongly correlated with the general level of economic development in the first place, which may in turn drive the relationship with well-being, more so than the climate action itself. So I, I want to put this caveat, caveat in place. Uh, this is not the case for SDG 12, Responsible Consumption and Production, uh, where we find a negative relationship very much continues, even when accounting for the general level of economic development. Um, if we move to the final slide, uh, here we kind of visualize uh, the results of the 17 SDGs uh, unpacked uh, in relation to well-being. And the size of each one of these slices in this pie reflects how much of the variance in well-being between countries is explained by the variation in the SDG scores for each one of these countries. And so as noted before, we find that those SDGs that stand out are good health, clean water, sanitation, Decent work, as well as industry, innovation, and infrastructure, these are the ones that seemingly uh, explain most of the variance uh, between countries. Uh, but as we found, uh, um, um, we, when looking specifically at responsible consumption and production, that actually explains variance from an unhappiness angle. So there's a number of caveats, important ones, to this analysis, including the number of observations available to us. Uh, when we, um, and also when you split this kind of variance decomposition uh, by world's regions, you'll find that the relative importance 
difference bet between the SDGs differs quite a bit uh, from one region to another. And so I'll conclude by saying that we strongly inv uh, uh, invite you to de delve into the chapter more uh, for more uh, uh, analyses. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan. Um, we'll now hear from our final chapter author today, Frank Bartella at Alto University, who comes to us from the happiest uh, self-rated country, Finland. Um, he's the co-author of chapter seven, which is entitled The Nordic Exceptionalism. What explains why the Nordic countries are constantly among the happiest in the world? Please take it away, Frank. Hi, and greetings from Finland, which, as said, was today ranked happiest in the world for the third time in a row. And actually, like all five Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and Iceland, we're in the top seven globally. And of course, right now, when people's lives and livelihoods are seriously threatened, this happiness might not seem like the most important topic. But my message to you is that the same root causes that explain Finnish and Nordic happiness can also explain why the Nordic societies will be resilient in the face of this current coronavirus epidemic. So in this chapter that I wrote together with my co-authors, Ben Greve, Bu Rothstein, and Yuva Saari, we aim to identify what are the key explanations for Nordic happiness by examining the empirical support for various proposed explanations. And we basically identified four key factors which seem to be explaining why Nordic countries are so happy. First one is the institutional quality, which is about like having functioning democracy and well-functioning institutions. So it includes factors such as free elections, free press, freedom of speech, low corruption, rule of law, and government effectiveness. And these all seem to like predict national happiness and can be as important as GDP in predicting that. And of course, like whenever institutional quality is measured, the Nordic countries tend to come up, come up at the top. For example, this Freedom House has, this, has an index of political rights and civil liberties, and only countries to receive full 100 points from that in the latest edition are Finland, Norway, and Sweden. Second factor is welfare state generosity, which is about pensions, unemployment benefits, labor market regulation, and other benefits to protect the citizen from various setbacks in life. And this has been also shown to be associated with citizen happiness, and Nordic countries are famous for their welfare state model, with public health care, free education, and relatively generous benefits for those facing various setbacks in life. So the Nordics probably don't have more extremely happy people than other countries, but instead, the state taking care of its citizens means that there are less extremely unhappy people in these countries. Third factor is about trust in other people and trust in institutions. So it's about like feeling connected to others, trusting them, and caring about them. And this also predicts happiness. And again, Nordic countries have exceptionally, exceptionally high levels of trust. For example, in Finland, as regards like how many people are satisfied with the president, 91% of people say that they are satisfied with the current president, 86% are trusting the police, and 79% say that they are happy to pay their taxes. And the fourth factor is about freedom to make life choices, which also plays a role in explaining happiness. So when people feel liberated from material necessity, from political oppression, and from cultural intolerance, they are better able to live autonomously, which also enhances their well-being. So these are the four factors, and these factors actually don't work in isolation, but actually feed into each other. If you can show the next slide. So there seems to be like certain like virtuous circle working here where well-functioning and democratic institutions are able to provide citizens extensive benefits and security. And because of that, people tend to trust these institutions and each other. And when they trust these institutions, it leads them to vote for parties which promise to preserve the welfare model. So the Nordics are like a high, high trust societies, and this plays a big role in explaining their happiness, but it also makes them strong and robust in facing a crisis. Some research actually shown that high levels of social capital seem to be make, make people's well-being more resilient to various national crises. So in the current coronavirus epidemic, high trust countries will likely be more resilient and the high trust makes it easier to engage in coordinated action and more likely that people will help each other during the crisis. So in the end, it also makes people feel, have the sense that we are, we are in this together and by being united, we will get through this. So happiness might not be something that sounds too relevant today, but trust is something all communities and countries need to get through this crisis. And here, the Nordic model seems to be especially well designed to generate such trust. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Frank. Just a final reminder to everyone to please submit your questions in the chat panel, um, and we will be addressing those very shortly. Thank you to all the authors for sharing these interesting insights. We will have the opportunity to learn more about each of these chapters in our upcoming SDSN webinar series. I'll now return the mic to Professor Sachs for a few final words. Please go ahead, Jack. Thank you very much. We're at the end of the hour, uh, and uh, I, I want to end first by thanking the authors of these wonderful chapters. As you heard, the uh, report is, is fascinating this year with very uh, pathbreaking work on absolutely key topics. So it's a very, very exciting read, and I'm so grateful to uh, the authors that have done such fantastic studies on uh, ranking uh, global cities on happiness, the rural-urban divide, environmental quality and happiness. Uh, my, my colleague, Jan Emanuel, on uh, his uh, leadership on studying sustainable development and happiness, and the great uh, chapter, really a very important one uh, that everybody's interested in, uh, how do the Nordic countries uh, do it? Uh, and how does Finland uh, keep that place? So we learned a lot about Nordic exceptionalism. I, I wanna thank uh, Laura, you and uh, all of our uh, co-editors uh, of the report. It's a joy for me to uh, have the chance to work together with you. And I want to close uh, by thanking our partners uh, who make this possible. Gallup, as you know, as you've heard uh, for every chapter, provides the foundational data. And congratulations to Gallup on its leadership. Uh, it, it does a unique job of enabling the world to understand uh, life satisfaction, uh, the sense of well being, uh, and many, many other aspects of uh, happiness and well being through this marvelous work that Gallup does. Uh, thanks uh, to the Ernesto Illy Foundation and uh, Illy Coffee. What a great uh, partnership! Uh, and uh, we're thinking of you, Italy is in a very uh, tough moment of this uh, epidemic. It's such a fabulous uh, country and such wonderful people. Please take care, and we're hoping for uh, quick uh, and effective solutions and saving lives. Uh, to uh, uh, Davide Bellotti and Davinas, uh, also uh, thank you for your inspiration. You told us about inhabiting. Uh, the planet, not uh, simply uh, uh, living our economic lives. And uh, this is uh, very smart. For uh, Jen Gross and Blue Chip uh, Foundation, thank you uh, not only for your wonderful partnership and your wonderful words, but also for uh, your leadership right now in the Los Angeles area in, in the midst of a very rapidly expanding a pandemic, uh, the soup kitchens and the help for the most vulnerable people. This is a reminder to all of us uh, about the kind of values that lead to well-being and happiness. So we're very grateful. And to uh, Unilever's uh, ice cream brand walls, we're so uh, thrilled uh, to have you as a, a new partner uh, and welcome to the family. But of course, Unilever is not a newcomer to well-being and sustainable development. Uh, it is uh, rightly regarded as one of the, the world's flagship leaders of corporate responsibility, corporate leadership for sustainable development. Uh, your former CEO, uh, my dear friend, uh, Paul Pullman, uh, is an iconic figure, uh, and uh, Unilever and Walls continues to be in the forefront of uh, the fight for sustainable development, which we also learned today is uh, very much uh, the effort to achieve well-being and happiness. So on behalf of all of us in uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network family, uh, and uh, with special thanks to Sharon Pakalor and uh, to Cheyenne Maddox, uh, Cheyenne Maddox and to uh, all of our SDSN team, let me wish everybody well Thank you for joining us. We will have a webinar on the happiness report to, for a longer and deeper dive into these fascinating chapters. And please join us for our worldwide 24 hour webinar. We'll circle the globe on April 22nd for Earth Day. 
uh, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And we'll be celebrating that on campuses and uh, SDSN members around the world. If you go to the website, unsdsn.org, you will get the inf information for this uh, fantastic 24-hour global extravaganza. But let me finally end by saying we've heard great words of wisdom. I think uh, John Halliwell's statement uh, should be the one that we close with, that we're not talking about social distancing. We are talking about physical distancing so that uh, the uh, virus uh, does not transmit and this epidemic stops. But we need social closeness. We need to stay together, especially at this time. Wishing everybody very well. Most grateful that you have joined us today. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. This is Sharon Pakalor. We're now moving on to the question and answer portion of our webinar. And uh, we've compiled some really great questions. Uh, please continue to uh, submit questions, as you see. I was wondering, uh, Professor Sachs, Jeff, are you still on the line? There is a question that I could uh, ask you. I am, you of course. So he can stay on the camera. So this comes from, I'm going to not say her last name right, but Judy. And she asks, how can these findings fit into a new United Nations agenda that will be negotiated to the follow-up current one, the Agenda 2030? And how can we build on advocacy? This is uh, the UN agenda very much in two literal senses. Uh, the UN agreed already back in 2000. 10 to 2011 that happiness should be a core part of the global cooperative approach to development and then in 2015 the un adopted the sustainable development goals and emphasized that sustainable development is at the uh, very uh, center of our efforts sustainable development meaning that we not just aim for economic development but also for social inclusion and for environmental sustainability. Well, you heard uh, in the chapters today that sustainable development is conducive to uh, happiness. And we also learned that uh, environmental sustainability directly contributes to good health and to the sense of well being. And so the UN has this as its agenda. Uh, this year is the 75th anniversary of the UN. So I think what our agenda is, is to recommit ourselves to the principles of the United Nations, to multilateralism, especially in this very difficult moment, uh, and uh, to use uh, the uh, UN Charter as the basis for putting well being and sustainable development at the very center of the world's. Uh, economic, social, uh, and environmental agenda. Thank you, Jeff. There's another question. I have this for uh, Christian Kreckel or George McCarran. And Yund asks, in the environmental factors for happiness, are there any cultural differences? That's that's such a good question um that's a really really good question um actually i'm not 100 percent sure about that uh, i would say that there are definitely country differences but it's very difficult to pinpoint this particularly in terms of cultural differences or whether this has something to do with the endowments of you know natural resources the environment environmental quantity environmental quality within a country I think it's difficult to separate this out in terms of cultural differences. It might probably be better to be done with experimental uh, research. Um, George, do you know anything there? Hi, Chris. No, no, I, I agree with what you're saying there. I think it's, it's difficult to disentangle uh, culturally in terms of um, you know, the environments that people have access to, are used to, uh, and enjoy. Um, some, some of the, you know, the, we, we, we look at two scales in this chapter. We look at the, the, the broader scale and the narrower scale. And actually, 
it's most easy to tell a convincing story about uh, environmental impacts on people when you look most locally. And I guess that's a little bit of a challenge, um, but that's a challenge that you know future research should certainly try to rise to in, in seeing how far these are universals and how far um, there are these cultural distinctions that we can draw. Thank you for both. Now I have another question, and this is for John Hilliwell, um, and it comes from Tim O'Shea. For any, all of the authors, well, I know that John can answer this, Canada regularly ranks higher in, the hap in happiness than the United States. What are the clearest differentiators, and how might these factors play out in the, in the way both countries handle the coronavirus? John? How's that? Am I properly connected? This is a question that's asked a great deal. And uh, so I, I know from many years, you will remember the six factors we use in explaining uh, differences between countries and uh, the uh, Canada has higher values on five of those six factors than does the United States. The only one where the United States is higher by about 20% is GDP per capita. The differences on the social trust, the generosity, the freedom to make uh, life choices and having someone to count on are enough to uh, more than offset that uh, difference. Uh, and of course, uh, it isn't income per capita that's going to make countries uh, respond more easily in the current environment. It is precisely the warmth and uh, the extent to which people are prepared to work together. Uh, I was impressed and I mentioned earlier that it's how, it's what you see about people reacting to conditions like this that give you real evidence about what kind of fabric is the society you're in. I was astonished at how much uh, in my local jurisdiction, British Columbia, all the political parties essentially said, we're all in this together and uh, we're, we'll, we'll do what our experts uh, tell us to do. And uh, in uh, the uh, just last week, uh, the uh, health authorities issued a self-tracking device to help people see what other treatment, if anything, they needed to monitor that condition, where had they been and so on. And that uh, had only been on the available for people uh, for uh, two to three days, and half the population of the province had all signed up on this. And uh, they, they had, through a survey afterwards, had uh, shown that having learned what they learned about themselves and what the experts had to say, they were much less likely, they were less concerned, they were much less likely to call the hotline, much less likely to go to the emergency room and much more likely to self-isolate at home. And one hopes to help their neighbors. Thank you, John. I think the next Back question, <laughs> the next question I will ask is for Jan Emanuel Deniv. Jan, and it goes on to the sustainable chapter that you wrote with Jeff. And the question is, um, one moment, I just lost my port. I think I texted. Um, my understanding is that, S, uh, this is from Vanessa Timmers. My understanding is that SDG 10 reducing inequality has a big impact on well-being quality of life. Why is it only a 0.32 correlation to the correlation table? I know it's very specific. <laughs> uh, no, it's a very good question. Um, uh, and I was personally also struck a little bit by that, but lest, uh, lest we forget, uh, this is a, a, a positive and a highly significant correlation with well-being. So reducing inequality globally uh, across nations um, is positively associated with, uh, with uh, improving well-being. If you look, and where it becomes interesting is in table 6.3, where you look at the split between nations, uh, uh, I'm sorry, between regions, and then you find there's lots of heterogeneity. So um, where uh, the reason why I think people like yourself or myself perhaps, perhaps more surprised is that if you just look at the European nations, uh, you find that that correlation is even stronger, um, in fact, 0.71, twice as strong 
Um, so, um, so that seems to be explaining more of the variance between uh, countries within Europe in terms of well-being, and it seems somewhat less strong uh, if you look uh, at other regions around the world. But that doesn't uh, necessarily. Um, so anyway, so it's uh, it shows that there's lots of regional heterogeneity and 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 how this feeds into people's well-being. But much more research needs to be done to try sure. and really get at this, this issue. Jan and Sharon, is it I, I, perhaps I could add something to that? Because one of the special features of Chapter Two this year was to look at the effects of inequality on well-being. We considered what it added. If you thought of it as the seventh factor, the answer is it added very significantly, and indeed, part of uh, a good part of the. Uh, Nordic results I was showing you were in fact because uh, the uh, higher levels of trust led to higher levels of well-being and much less inequality and that lower inequality itself was it pushing up well-being and we found those inequality effects significant in all parts of the world and this is in the context of our more uh, general model where in fact uh, I think they're telling us something, uh, and it's, it's subjective well-being inequality we're looking at. You know, people often think just of income as being the important source of inequality, and it turns out that we find that inequality of well-being, how access, what kind of access people have to basic necessities, to friends, to a supportive social environment, these other things that don't relate directly to income, in fact, are uh, much more important and uh, are really where inequality really counts. Thank you. Thank you both. If Professor Sachs is still on, I do have a question relating to Africa. Jeff, are you still on? If not, Hi. we can... Hi, Jeff. Yes, Hi. this comes from Othman Musa, and uh, they ask, how can we help people in Africa understand the importance of the International Day of Happiness? Most of them are suffering due to COVID-19. How can we help them to improve life during this pandemic? Well, uh, the, the key for all of us, first of all, is uh, to stay safe uh, and uh, to try to stay away from uh, the virus, uh, and especially to help keep uh, older people and uh, people who are highly vulnerable uh, away from the crisis. Uh, we're way behind the curve uh, on this. And in Africa, in many countries, the health systems uh, are uh, not strong to begin with. Uh, so we need solidarity also to support African governments uh, to uh, promote uh, community health workers who can help uh, the control of the epidemic. Uh, we need uh, solidarity in uh, sharing vital equipment, especially for countries uh, that uh, don't have budgets on their own, uh, protective gear uh, for uh, hospitals and clinics. We need to establish online support by WHO, uh, the World Health Organization, <laughs> to enable health personnel all over the world, including in Africa, through online means to get the information that is needed. But I want to keep emphasizing that the first and foremost priority of this epidemic is saving lives and stopping the epidemic itself. And we're in that battle. And it's very tough. And it's uh, for the next few months. And the whole world has to hold together. So thank you for the question. Uh, it reminds me uh, how much we're going to have to emphasize help for countries uh, that don't have the budgets on their own to be able to deploy all of the personnel and equipment that's going to be needed in this epidemic. And uh, I think that this is uh, one of the key messages and uh, a key reminder of your very good question. Thank you, Jeff. This uh, next question is uh, for our friends at Chapter 4 about the uh, urban and um, rural divide. So, Martin, if uh, you're still available, if you could answer this question, I will see. Are you on camera? If not, 
um, maybe one of our authors can answer this question. So the question is, given the urban rural divide in happiness, how do towns and mid-sized settlements rank? Perhaps there could be planning which create, created settlements of size, which provided public services while still maintaining community and connection to nature. Let me know if you need me to reiterate the question. Does anyone want to answer? Sure, sure. I'll take a hack at that if you want. Um, there is something that I had wanted to mention on this urban rural issue, and it's something that uh, uh, is taken up very much in chapter one, uh, is that the difference between urban and rural happiness, you, you noticed it was higher outside. A direct answer to this question is these peri-urban areas tend to be partway between the rural and the urban uh, in, in, in most countries. The uh, differentiation between the happy and less happy parts of the country often gets entirely, almost entirely explained by the warmth of the social connection. So in countries like Canada, for example, where we have a lot of data in big cities, small cities, rural areas, and where in general, the rural areas are happier than the middle areas are happier than the cities. And it's almost entirely due to the extent to which people feel a sense of belonging to their local community. And it's when that in those cities and in those neighborhoods where that sense of belonging can be built or restored or maintained, then people are happier where those are. So it isn't really rural versus city. It's maintaining that kind of social contact and structure and uh, and and shared values that uh, that support life generally. And they can be built and maintained in cities or in uh, in rural areas, and I'm sure the contact with nature is the same sort of thing. An additional result to the uh, chapter and work that uh, George McCarran uh, did is that we found that doing things in green spaces is very nice, but to do them in conjunction uh, with a friend or family member has a much bigger effect than just the environment itself. And so even, whatever you're doing, you want to do it in a way where you feel connected with others and ideally in physical connection with them and nowadays in a, a more remote emotional connection. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I can maybe add to this another another angle. So in terms of like the social connections, I, I completely agree with John that is extremely important. What you often see is that, you know, if you have like an urban core, you have like a, a ring around it, like a first ring and a second ring. And usually in the second ring, you can see that, you know, usually well-being decreases quite a lot, right? So it's also like an, an important to have like a physical infrastructure that connects all these rings and that reduces frictions because government usually city government often ends at the urban you know with the urban borders and then sort of we have frictions in government and services and infrastructure the, the train connection just stops doesn't go further and all these kind of things so i think that people also feel like sort of left behind and there's also often not the possibility to get really into the social contact physically right because it, it simply takes too much time or it's too effortful to actually do this bridge so there's an important, uh, an important role for infrastructure to play too, connectivity. Actually, Christian, if uh, you can stay on, there is another question about um, environments and so forth, um, the pertaining to your um, chapter. One moment, let me just pull it up. Um, or I guess this could also be to all the directors. What environmental activities and amenities can local governments best introduce to increase happiness and well-being for all local society? More green spaces such as parks and nature reserves or encourage, uh, encourage create blue spaces involving water sports activities. What are your thoughts and suggestions? You can start us off, Christian, and then any of the other editors can jump in. Yeah. Well, it's a difficult question because it's sort of like points to the to the fact what is the most the single most important thing and i think there's actually not a single most important thing because there are many many factors which which actually play into that so i've done a lot of research on green spaces and uh, green spaces do add significantly for people living in their surroundings 
by providing you know space for recreation by also providing health benefits if you're living closer to a green space encouraging you to do more sports um, they are important they are significant actually for an individual small but they affect quite a lot of people um, so that's why they're important but then again you know i would say i would find it difficult to like play it off against other things like infrastructure connectivity infrastructure um, so i'm not sure that there's a single most important uh, infrastructure type but there's more like a menu a balanced menu of infrastructure which also you know includes things like affordable housing high quality housing and of course there's always like a um a problem because if you increase incre increase green spaces right you take away space for housing and cities are often limited in terms of their size so in the uk for example we have a green belt around cities which sort of naturally limits the the uh, expansion that the city can get and i think it's more like a, a mix of different policy instruments that need to come into into play to um to increase maximize well-being Thank you very much. Um, this next question is actually for Jan. Jan, if you're still on, and if you can turn on your camera. Sherman asks, if there's one thing that we should implement in societies and workplaces to improve well-being, what would the editors recommend? Um, I don't speak necessarily for all the editors, but I think for a few, uh, when I say social connection, social capital in the workspace. So we, in a, in a previous World Happiness Report and a chapter called um, happiness at work. Um, we um, studied all the possible drivers and aspects of, of employee well-being and out of all possible dimensions from how many, how many hours you spend at work to how much you're being paid to work-life balance to the quality of relations on the job. What we found stood out as number one uh, was uh, how you rate the quality of relations on the job. And so, uh, for example, um, it's a cliche in the HR industry, but people don't quit their jobs, they quit their managers. Uh, so if they're unhappy with the social ties around them, their, their, their colleagues and especially the line manager, that's when they actually make the decision to leave companies. And so if there's one thing that, if I mean, there's many things people can do to try and improve workplace well-being. But if there's one thing, if I can only do one thing, it would be to try and improve and make more space for uh, positive social connections and particularly with an emphasis on line managers. So that would mean specific interventions, some of which are, are known, and I'm happy to share this offline. Um, to try and improve links uh, and how managers um, uh, appreciate and work with their team members. There's a number of specific interventions to try and raise empathy and making managers uh, better managers, really. Uh, and I think it's that's that's the key is that the, the whole middle management that doesn't get that doesn't usually take advantage of executive education classes or does not give be given the opportunity. It's working with uh, middle management and corporations. I think is where the biggest gains are to be had in terms of improving workplace well-being. Excellent. Richard, yeah, I see yeah. that. I, I, want, I, want, I wanted to add to that because yeah, uh, I think work is a hugely important part of our life, but all of our life is affected by our mental health. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at what factors best explain the huge variation in happiness uh, across the populations, especially in advanced countries, you see that the single factor that has the biggest influence um, is the individual's mental health in a very precise sense, whether they've ever been uh, diagnosed with depression or anxiety disorder. This is a much bigger factor uh, than income or even the quality of work in explaining uh, the spread of happiness and unhappiness in, in the population. This would uh, not help us uh, to solve your problem that the questioner asked, if it weren't for the fact that we now know an awful lot of what to do about uh, mental illness. We've got really good evidence-based treatments. Uh, in Britain, we've been rolling these out throughout our National Health Service in a brand new service. Uh, and the service is now being copied in six other countries based on the latest evidence uh, of the effectiveness of different types of therapy. I think it's also very important uh, that we should see the schools as major levers for improving the mental health of the population, preventing mental illness. Uh, and there, again, we should be using evidence of what forms of school organisation uh, and school uh, teaching uh, promote mental well-being in the children. Um, 
there are some very, very good programs. Um, one I've been involved in called Healthy Minds, but others worldwide uh, that can be used so that we don't depend to teach life skills. We don't have to depend on an absolutely brilliant teacher. We can know that ordinary teachers, well trained, using these brilliant materials, will be able to change the life of children. And we also know that the emotional health of children is the best predictor of whether uh, the same person will be a happy adult. So I would say, if you asked me <laughs> the question, I would have said um, a completely new approach to mental health, both the treatment um, of people with these terrible problems, um, really causing chaos in many families as well as for themselves, um, and serious use of the school system to promote mental health. Thank you, Richard. That was actually a question that uh, someone had, and I don't know if you wanted to expand on this, but S. Young asked, will happiness level be changed along with education standard of people in a country? Should happiness be linked to physical, mental, and spiritual elements? Do you want to expound on that? Yes, I could say a little on that. Um, when you're talking about expanding education, uh, you 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 may be making uh, reference to more people staying on longer in their education, um, and if we're talking about that, um, we should very much be talking about what kind of education are they staying on longer in, um, because we have had in many countries um, a, a, a shocking neglect, especially this is true in Britain and the United States, a shocking neglect of the vocational education of people um, who don't go to university. And I think that to uh, give them a proper introduction to adult life through an apprenticeship of the kind that is being offered in Germany and some other countries would be hugely beneficial for well-being and a sense of purpose uh, of those people. Otherwise, I come back to my point about uh, changing the purpose of education for everybody. The purpose of education should be thought of to enable the young people to uh, experience uh, a happy life themselves and to create uh, happiness for the people whom they can touch, either through the work that they do or through their family life uh, or whatever. And this is not something that just should be assumed to happen by accident. It shouldn't be assumed to happen just because of what the parents do for the children. In our research, we've had this extraordinary finding that schools make as much difference to the happiness uh, of their uh, children um, as the parents did. So a, a, a very strong focus on uh, the happiness of children and the necessity for teachers all to be trained in mental health and also I would say to be given a higher status in the community generally. Thank you Richard. Jeff, there's two questions that um, are more specific to you if you are still on the line. I if am. Not. Hi Jeff. So there's two questions. Um, one is from a SIPA student, Sophia Zhang. Uh, she first asked, do you have any suggestions for future topics relating to well-being and sustainable development? And I'll ask the second question after you answer that. Why don't you ask the second one also? So the second question is, oops, I just lost it. Um, I actually lost it. I'll be right back with you. You can go. <laughs> oh, can you explain more about SDG 12 on responsible consumption and the production and production explains negative variance. I think that's actually a John question. No, 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 that that comes out of our paper. Uh, yeah. yeah, with uh, Yana Manuel. Uh, basically, uh, uh, the, the reason in a simple way that these uh, uh, two environmental SDGs, SDG 13 and SDG 12, show up as negatively correlated is that richer countries do worse uh, on uh, the sustainability of waste management, which is SDG 12, and on 
uh, carbon emissions, uh, which is what's measured in SDG 13. And uh, what Yana Manuel showed and what the chapter on environmental quality showed is if you dig beneath the simple correlation, there are real reasons to believe that environmental sustainability is uh, in fact very important for our well-being. But at a simple level, the rich countries are the polluting countries. Uh, they pollute with the wastes, which is what uh, the SDG 12 is focusing on, and they pollute with the greenhouse gas emissions, which is what SDG 13 uh, is focusing on. Well, in terms of the research agenda, uh, the fundamental question that we're asking is how to raise the world's happiness uh, and uh, what can be done uh, most effectively uh, to improve well-being. We have, uh, in addition to the World Happiness Report, uh, a report each year called the Global uh, policy report uh, on happiness and well-being, uh, or the Global Happiness and Well-Being Policy Report, uh, which is uh, produced by the Global Happiness Council uh, that is uh, created by the uh, government of the United Arab Emirates with the participation of many other countries. And the idea there specifically is to ask what public policies are most conducive to promoting happiness. Now, we've been discussing that uh, throughout uh, this session, uh, but I think that that is a continuing and very active area for work. How to put happiness into the political agenda, how to put happiness into the policy agenda, how to identify or measure the policies that do promote happiness from those that uh, take away from uh, well-being. Uh, Bhutan famously uh, has a, a, a global uh, happiness, national happiness commission, uh, and uh, they're looking uh, for many, many years specifically at evaluating how policies uh, affect uh, life satisfaction and well-being. And I would say from a research point of view and somebody at uh, SIPA at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs, this is a very pertinent topic. How should our politics be organized? How should our policies be organized uh, in order to promote uh, this life satisfaction, which all of us uh, as editors uh, and as the UN system believes should be the centerpiece of, after all, what our public policy is about. Thank you, Jeff. Um, this next question is actually for our resident um, Nordic number one country, <laughs> Finland. This is for Frank. Um, and I have two questions for you, Frank, if you are still on the line. And you are indeed, if you can turn on your camera. Um, the first question is, can happiness be a life goal? Could helping others be that life goal or be a life goal? And the second question is from Ignacio, which he asked, my question is whenever variables such as number of patients hit by depression or even suicide rates have been taken into consideration in the report, do you think you could find any correlation or contradictory findings between the highest ranked Scandinavian countries and these rates? I know this is something that we've, uh, editors are always asked. Okay, thanks for the question. So first was like, if I were to correct, like, can happiness be a life goal? And personally, I think that, you know, I think happiness is a very good goal for like, on a societal level, that in, in the so societies, we should like aim for improve people's happiness. I think that has been like, like the idea of democratic societies since the 18th century, that one, one key goal and like justification for having the government is that government should be like pursuing the goal of in increasing people's happiness. But on an individual level, even though it's good to have like on certain level of happiness and be happy, but I think like sometimes like if you too much emphasize your own happiness, if you focus too like strongly on making yourself happiness, that can actually backfire, not even make you like less happy because too much focus on your individual happiness might make you like you're unable to like be satisfied with any situation. You're always looking for like is there something which is still better somewhere else, and that makes it makes you miss out on enjoying the life as you have it right now. 
And also it easily makes you like too <laughs> selfish, focusing only on yourself, which makes you neglect your like social relationships, which we know is like one of the key sources of happiness for most people around the world. So that was the first question. And the second question about like this depression rates and suicide rates around the world. And, and as regards to that, for depression, it seems to me that it's like quite hard to like have any reliable international comparisons of depression rates. Because when we have like international comparisons, people who are like severely depressed se tend to not answer these surveys. So because of that, like when you look at different like international comparisons of depression rates, there's like very much like variability. And in one ranking, Finland might be like quite close to the top. In the second ranking, it might be like in the middle. And the third ranking must, might be in one of the countries is like quite low on the side on, on this depression levels. And I think it seems to be like, you know, when I've been looking at these like different like rankings, it seems to be that in the end, Finland is somewhere in like average level in the terms of depression and other Nordic countries as well. So the Nordic countries are not the best countries in the world in terms of like preventing depression or even preventing suicide, but they are not the worst countries either. And they're, they seem to be like working quite like relatively independent of each other, especially the suicide rates. It, it seems to be something which doesn't have too much to do with the national happiness level, because it's still so rare occasion that it might be like some other factors are driving it, which don't have much to do with what is the average level of happiness in the country. Thank you very much, Frank. I'd just like to add to everyone that I have a post these questions and also answer them. Oh, hi, John. Can I like add? add a little bit on the, on the suicide issue? Because uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, I was asked this question very frequently about if they're so happy in Sweden, why are they uh, committing uh, suicide so frequently? So we put together a very large data set at that time and used exactly the same model, very like the model we use now in the World Happiness Report to explain differences uh, uh, across countries in uh, happiness and use the same model to explain differences across countries in suicide rates. Two of the key variables in both were the extent to which other people can be trusted and the warmth of, and frequency of social connections with other people. Both of them had exactly the same effects on suicide rates as they had on life satisfaction, improving life satisfaction and raising suicide rates. The fact that countries were different on suicide rates and uh, life satisfaction were basically different effect sizes on other things, such as uh, divorce being worse for suicide than, uh, uh, than for life satisfaction, uh, religious affiliation being more protective against suicide than production of, uh, of, of happiness, higher government, be better government being more important for life satisfaction than preventing suicide. So Sweden, for example, fit both models perfectly. And in both cases, uh, there was no inconsistency uh, at all. So I was able to use that frequently in subsequent discussions, including this one. I'd like to ask uh, you, Sharon, if you could pass the microphone to Lara to say something about the previous question, which is about the value in making pro-social behavior uh, a, a focus of life and how that related to life satisfaction, because we had a special chapter on that last year and she was the principal author and she could help us. Thank you. Actually, Laura is no longer online, but we can share her chapter on that. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that she's no longer on, but we, we can share. So all of these questions will be posted and we'll try to um, put a Q&A document with this webinar. Um, I see that there are still a lot of attendees left um, and I do still have a few more questions. Um, we can keep going if you want, but this is a question to all our um, authors or experts on the line. Do you find any key differences in the environment in terms of gender equality and well-being? Does anyone want to answer that? I want to comment on, the, if I may, on the previous question, <laughs> um, because I thought that what, what Frank said was, was extraordinarily important. Um, there is, I mean, most of the problems that people have with the idea of happiness as a goal is because they're confused with, is it a goal for a group of people, for a society, or is it a goal for uh, each individual to be pursuing 
the answer is obviously that it should be the goal for the overall outcome in society but we're not going to get that achieve a good uh, result for the society if each individual makes it their personal goal um, in fact uh, as we know John Stuart Mill and others have pointed out that if you're always thinking about your own happiness uh, you probably aren't going to be even very happy so we want people to be getting their happiness through creating happiness for other people and um, I, I recently published a book called can we be happier and I, I made what I think is a really important distinction of between for each individual between what is the happiness that they experience and what is the happiness that they create we really want individuals we want an outcome where people are experiencing happiness but for that outcome to come about we want each individual to be a creator of happiness and the way we should think about how we do how do we create a happy society is by making individuals into creators of happiness and each of us ourselves trying to be creators of happiness thank you Rich. um jeff i have two ai questions for you will you be able to turn on your camera of course so s young asks so there's two questions yes young asks is there any ai and blockchain technology on coronavirus detection and the second comes from lucas who asks what do you think how should we approach ai automation from a global perspective a lot yeah. of reports show that actually they can broaden the gap between those who have and don't have access to new technologies on the first of uh, whether uh, ai uh, is used for corona detection um i'm probably not uh, the the expert on this except that the the, the best detection we have right now is uh, what's called the PCR detection of the virus itself, a polymerase chain reaction uh, detection of the virus. And one of the big problems is that uh, it requires uh, equipment and uh, there's therefore uh, under testing right now and much more infection than is uh, apparent from the measured data because many, many uh, people infected are not recorded in the data because they haven't been tested by the approved system. So I think uh, we have a, a a testing method, but it has not been expanded adequately in, in most countries. That's part of the scramble right now. On the uh, broader question about the role of AI in uh, the digital economy on well-being, uh, there's a lot to say, but I think the short uh, statement is that these technologies are very powerful and they're causing a major disruption in the workforce. A lot of people will lose their jobs because of uh, automation or the shift to e-commerce or the shift to expert uh, systems. And that raises many questions about the income distribution, basic income, retraining, and also with machines being able to do so much work, taking greater leisure time and having the leisure time more fairly shared in the society. So this is a general uh, topic of the interest and research and a lot of anxiety too, because uh, one thing we can say absolutely for sure right now is that the digital technologies are powerful. Uh, they can accomplish a lot. Uh, they uh, can have a high productivity, but they will displace a lot of work and they will widen inequalities in various ways and therefore pose new challenges for a solidaristic approach uh, to uh, uh, a very changed type of work environment. Maybe Jan Manuel wants to uh, add to that. Uh, just a little bit, because Jeff, you're obviously completely right, and I just want to build a little bit on the how will the AI and future of work um, impact the drivers of employee well-being? Because most economists talk about the how will it displace jobs and will there be transitioning uh, and the impact on income inequality. And I, I feel like we need to also bring into the mix the 
how will the future of work impact employee well-being? Because we know that jobs are more than just the pay associated with them. And so the question then becomes these other drivers or the other aspects of a job that are so important, like identity, like social relations, like your routine throughout the day, how will these be impacted through by AI? And I'm worried on that front because when we run these analyses of which are the important drivers, the ones that are uh, most important are also the ones that are most being put under pressure of AI. So if we think of our gig economy type workers, their manager and their peers are either non-existent or algorithmic platforms as a manager uh, who are essentially bossing them around. Uh, there's no human connection for a lot of these people. Um, there's the advantage of flexibility through these gig platforms, but the downside is people have completely lost their routines. They have strange working hours and odd sleeping patterns as a result. Um, and then in the crisis now, this week, we're going to see a million people being laid off in the United States and asking for employment uh, benefits. Well, most of these are people in the gig economy. So in a way, COVID-19 is laying bare a lot of the issues of the, the, of the beginnings of the future of work. Um, and in conversation with the ILO um, director, um, most of the focus at the moment is on the quantitative aspect of uh, job uh, displacement and transitioning. More, um, much more attention needs to be brought on to how that will change the role that work is playing for well-being. And as the questioner uh, of rightly pointed, for a handful of people or a small minority, it will improve uh, their, their ways of working. But for the vast majority of people, it will put, it will put more pressure both on the traditional uh, aspects of, of income inequality and, and put even more pressure and skill polarized, but there will also be put pressure on their typical drivers of employee well-being. So on balance, I'm very worried about the, uh, the role, of how the future of work will in, influence well-being. Thank you, Jeff and Jan. Um, we're about to uh, probably be wrap up because it's almost 12 noon here uh, in New York City. Um, there is one question that I would like to ask before we end, but I just wanted to remind everyone that um, we have collected all your questions. We will indeed answer them um, and we'll put them on our website. Please also know that this webinar is being recorded and will also be posted and we will share that. Um, I want to invite everyone to go to the uh, World Happiness Report website and read all these wonderful chapters that we prepared this year. Um, so I am going to ask the last question, and this is uh, just, I guess, open mic. Um, uh, Ranuka Patel asks, please suggest what would be the basic need of happiness for people living in different living standards in our societies with different means? And then we can wrap up with that. Does anyone want to take this question? Nobody. <laughs> Jeff? That's all I have to go. That's a yeah, big one. Jeff and I are both jumping in on that. You wrap up. I, mean, uh, I, I will actually uh, first give it to you and second to thank everybody. Uh, we're at the end of the hour and John will give us a, a, a departing wise words. Thanks. What's most important is that the things that support happiness are those that are relevant locally, and that decision is made locally rather than top down. So the quest, they will evolve in a community that's connected. They will discover what's most important in their lives looking ahead. What we did discover quite early on in this research was that the basic needs of life and especially the social ones were equally important in every culture. So the kind of things we've been emphasizing today about creating an environment in which people feel they belong and uh, they are masters of the design of that is absolutely critical, more so now than ever, but at all stages of development uh, and in all cultures we have found. So the, the things that we share in terms of what is important they are much more important than the measures on which we differ. Uh, I've been asked to thank everybody for the contributions. It's been heartwarming to see the uh, community of spirit that people have had and the number of people who have joined us for this webinar. Uh, thank you all very much and keep safe. I'm returning it now, I think, to Sharon. Thank you everyone for joining this on um, the webinar. Again, your questions will not go into a black hole. We will try to post them and answer them as best as we can. Um, again, please 
go on to our website at uh, World Happiness Report and read the report and uh, feel free to ask us any other questions that you may have. And we hope that everyone stays safe and wash your hands and continue to have social connections during this difficult time that we have. Thank you, everyone.